It was a dark and wet morning in a field just north of the town of Kirkcaldy on the east coast of Scotland. Despite the early hour, two men of reasonable means faced one another 12 paces apart. A signal was given and both men raised their right hands. The crack of two pistols being fired simultaneously echoed off the nearby trees. One man slumped to the ground, dead. Why might two rational, well-educated men try to resolve a dispute by shooting at one another? In this video, I'm going to look at the last recorded fatal duel in Scotland, as well as a brief history of duelling itself. Duelling isn't something entirely relegated to the past. The Queen still has an official champion, whose job it is to challenge anyone who disputes the right and title of the British monarch. In the state of Kentucky, public officials are still obliged to swear, I, being a citizen of this state, have not fought a duel with deadly weapons within this state, nor out of it. Nor have I acted as second in carrying a challenge, nor aided or assisted any person thus offending. So help me God. More recently, in 2004, two cousins in Mexico had a duel over access to a well on the boundary of their properties. In 2002, the Vice President of Iraq suggested a duel between Saddam Hussein and George W. Bush. And it's kind of hard to see the downside to that one, to be honest. The ritual of trial by combat can trace its origins to Germanic tribes and pagans of Scandinavia in the first few centuries AD. The Scandinavian version involved lashing the opponents together by the chest, while naked, and dumping them on an isolated island somewhere and giving each of them a knife. The one left standing was the winner. By the 6th century AD, trial by combat had been formalised by a king of Burgundy called Gudenbald. No bald jokes please. Believing that God determined the outcomes of battles, why wouldn't the Almighty decide the outcome of lesser disputes? Pulling together Roman, Celtic and Germanic traditions, Lex Burgundierum, or Burgundy Law, was trial by combat overseen by judges and witnesses. God would protect the innocent and condemn the guilty, or so the theory went. The alternative was trial by ordeal, basically where some grotesque injury was inflicted upon someone and the healing was then left up to God. Like most rituals, there are strict rules and a purification process. Combatants would often be ceremoniously shaved and oiled. The accuser would enter the arena from the south, the defendant from the north. Clerics would attempt to have the pair resolve their disputes amicably, and if they couldn't, they would swear on the Bible to their innocence. After this, a gauntlet or a glove would be thrown down by the accuser, and if the challenge was accepted, the defendant would pick the glove up. People of all walks of life could duel. Nobles would often fight on horseback and commoners would fight with sticks. If the victor disabled his opponent, he had every right to kill him or grant him mercy. If a fight went on until the stars came out, the accuser was considered vindicated. Trials by combat were largely fought by two men. Children, men over 60, Priests and the disabled were exempt, though they could have someone fight on their behalf. Women occasionally fought men, but only if the man was buried up to his waist to level the playing field, as it were. By the end of the Middle Ages, trials such as these were deemed unsuitable in Britain, and evidence-based trials became more common. Providence just always seemed to be on the side of the more muscular or more skillful combatant. Funny that. Between the 14th and 18th centuries, duels had become more chivalric and were more based on honour and redress and less about brute strength, which just so happened to coincide with the invention of the hand pistol. It wasn't until the 22nd of March 1819 for trial by combat to be completely outlawed in the United Kingdom. That year, a man named Abraham Thornton claimed his right to trial by combat after being accused of murdering a young girl named Mary Ashford. The Court of Appeal reluctantly agreed that under the law, Thornton did have that right 
and was freed on the grounds that there was no one to fight on the murdered girl's behalf. This loophole was quickly closed. The duel we're concerned about happened in 1826 in the midst of an economic slump. The wars against Napoleon, concluded in 1815, had bankrupted Britain. Every industry was feeling the pinch, including linen manufacture and associated works such as flax growing and spinning, bleaching and exporting. David Landale, a linen merchant of Kirkcaldy Fife, had just been voted chair of a committee set up to protect the interests of the industry. Across the United Kingdom, threats of revolution were abundant during this depression. The Luddite workers destroyed their machines in an attempt to halt progress. The Cato Street conspirators sought to kill all members of parliament. The Scottish insurrection of 1820 demanded electoral reform and better working conditions. David Landale, however, had little interest in such radicalism. He was more concerned that the economic depression and subsequent political unrest was bad for business. David Landale was born on the 27th of November 1786 to a prosperous and industrious family. His father, grandfather and great-grandfather were all leather merchants and had owned ships. His older brother took over the leather and tanning business while David expanded into linen and yarn. In October 1818, he established the Kirkcaldy and Leith Shipping Company and a few years later, while he was in his early 30s, would be one of the most prosperous men in the region. While he was not considered to be landed gentry, he was a gentleman, an extremely devout gentleman at that, and a man of fine character and honour. For Landale, character and honour was all. David Landale and co were successful in the flax industry in the early 1820s, but by the middle of the decade, the economic depression began squeezing tighter and tighter. In January 1826, the Bank of Scotland asked its Kirkcaldy agents, brothers David and George Morgan, to assess how local merchants were faring. They found David Landale and co quite good and as they employ a great many people here, as well as at their bleach field, they give active and great circulation to the bank's notes. This positive assessment and general agreeableness would not last. George Morgan was born on the 22nd of December 1781, the second son of a Kirkcaldy merchant. In 1812, he went to Spain as an ensign to fight against Napoleon, eventually returning in 1817 having risen to the rank of lieutenant. He was 36, unmarried and had no profession, so joined his brother at the Bank of Scotland in Kirkcaldy. The town of Kirkcaldy was no stranger to jewels. The Christmas edition of the Glasgow Sentinel in 1821 featured a poem calling James Stewart of Duncarn, a distinguished Tory gentleman, a coward. Stewart tracked down the person who wrote the poem a distant cousin of his named Sir Alexander Bozel. Stuart eventually challenged Bozel to a duel, and the latter immediately accepted. They met just outside Kirkcaldy at dawn on the 26th of March 1821. Stuart was not an experienced gunman and pleaded that he would just accept an apology. Bozel refused. He told his second that he actually bore no ill will to Stuart and just wanted to scare him by firing his pistol into the air. They took 12 paces apart, both men turned and fired. Stuart's bullet struck Bozel in the shoulder, shattering his shoulder blade, a fragment of which slid onto his spine and rendered him paralysed. He was carried to Balmuto House nearby and lay in great pain until 3pm the next day when he died. As duelling had just been outlawed only a few years earlier, Stuart was now accused of murder. He was defended by Messrs Coburn and Jeffrey, who argued that Stuart's pleas for an apology and his upset at the death of Bozel proved he had attended the field without an atom of malice. The jury unanimously agreed and Stuart was acquitted in what was the highest profile legal case in Scotland for many years. A few years later, David Landale's flax business was suffering. The flax trade had all but stopped. He was in debt and he didn't have enough land to finish the orders he did have. Being in debt, he couldn't imagine getting a loan from the bank to buy more land. He had received two bills of exchange, essentially IOUs, 
each worth £300, which he took to the bank to clear some of his debts. Though the bank trusted Landale, they did not trust the firms who had issued the IOUs and demanded hard cash instead. The Morgans were inadvertently tarnishing Landale's character. His character was further tarnished when the Morgans refused Landale's offer of £1,000 worth of yarn as collateral. When another merchant paid Landale £600 in cash and a promissory note for £400, the Morgans again demanded cash alone. Landale felt the Morgans were causing him unnecessary inconvenience and embarrassment. Eventually, the Morgans acquiesced and took the cheque. As the pinch grew tighter, Landale bypassed the Morgans and went straight to the directors of the Bank of Scotland in Edinburgh and remortgaged some of his property to help sustain him during the recession, to which they agreed. A week later, on the 25th of April 1826, David Landale strolled into the Bank of Scotland in Kirkcaldy to meet with George and David Morgan. He had a bill to be paid at Messrs Coots & Co, the Bank of Scotland's agents in London, worth £1,000, and asked if they could order it paid. It was due in five days' time. They agreed on the proviso that Landale would pay them back one day after that. Landale left the bank, knowing his business was complete. Or so he thought. The Morgans had changed their minds. They sent a messenger to Landale's house, suggesting he ask for an extension instead, something that was impossible given the time it would take to contact London and to have the extension approved, or not, as the case may be. The Morgans were damaging Landale's credit and his honour. Unsurprisingly, he was raging. He blew up at the messenger, wrote to the Morgans to ask them to reconsider, but still they said no. To sort out the situation, Landale was forced to approach another local bank, the National Bank, who immediately took on his payment based on his reputation as, a, as an honourable businessman alone. He later withdrew all his accounts from the Bank of Scotland and moved them to the National Bank. He wrote, Having thus been forced from the bank with whom my father and I have had an account for upwards of 40 years and with no other, I contented myself that my intercourse with the Messrs Morgan was at an end. George Morgan Esquire, lately lieutenant in the 77th Regiment of Foot, however, had other ideas. The historian Anthony Simpson said of George Morgan, he was a typical temporary gentleman, one of a class of ex-soldiers that had absorbed aristocratic values without having been favoured by the social background or the financial wherewithal to put these to good effect. James Landale, author of the book Jewel and relation to David Landale of our story, described Morgan in a perhaps biased way. George was a snob. A bore and a vindictive bully. According to one Kirkcaldy historian, he was a touchy, fire-eating kind of man. He carried a walking cane and would shake it angrily at people, threatening to give them a beating, being almost incapable of holding a conversation without taking offence. Some dispute between George Morgan and a rival banker named Robert Kirk led Morgan to kick at Kirk's walking stick while he leaned on it, making Kirk fall flat on his face. Morgan clearly had it in for Kirk, as when walking along the pavement by Kirk's shop, despite there being plenty of room on the pavement, Morgan bumped into him on purpose, almost knocking him down. What do you mean, sir? Kirk demanded. Morgan replied, you are a damned scoundrel, and walked on before turning around and walking back and walking into Kirk. This he did six times. Eventually, Kirk responded by grabbing Morgan's collar and demanding, What do you mean by this sort of conduct? Morgan replied, I want you to give me a challenge. Call me out, sir, and I will do for you. Kirk declined. A few days later, Morgan repeated his conduct, deliberately bumping into Kirk again. You're a damned scoundrel, Morgan repeated. Will you go down hatchets close? referring to a nearby dark alleyway. This time, Kirk agreed and marched down the close. Morgan didn't follow and instead ran away. A month later, however, he was back to his old tricks and went to hit Kirk across the face with his stick. 
Kirk grabbed it and refused to let go. A witness corroborated Kirk's version of events. Now, Robert Kirk had every right to challenge George Morgan to a duel. Before dueling was outlawed, he practically had an obligation to challenge George Morgan to a duel. But times and attitudes were changing quickly. Kirk and his circle of friends didn't consider George Morgan's actions to be gentlemanly, and only gentlemen dueled. Another example of Morgan's petty and vindictive nature involved a man named Graham, who so wronged Morgan that Morgan bought Graham's shop and accommodation and evicted him. He also challenged Graham to a duel on at least one occasion. With Landale withdrawing his accounts from Morgan's bank, his pettiness and his ire once more came to the fore. Morgan bumped into one of Landale's oldest friends, fellow linen merchant Robert Stocks. Morgan made up a story that Landale had received £5,000 cash credit from the bank and had remortgaged his bleach field for £1,000 and wished Landale well. On the face of it, this tale doesn't seem like much of an issue, but in a small town like Kirkcaldy, a vague story like this would likely grow arms and legs. Morgan then gossiped to an accountant friend, James Fleming, that the bank had lost faith in Landale. Fleming passed this on to Robert Ingalls, a manufacturer from nearby Mark Inch. Rumours like this between merchants, to say nothing of bankers, could kill a business overnight. Which is exactly what happened. Those who were owed money by Landale immediately called in all their debts at once, and David Landale lost his credit. Such was the fragile nature of business at the time. Rumours from an untrustworthy source could call into question the honour of a merchant. David Landale was understandably furious and set about finding the source of these rumours. He chased it back through his friends and business partners, back to a bank teller at the Bank of Scotland. And so it made sense. The Morgans at the Bank of Scotland, annoyed at Landale for moving his business to the National Bank, had set out to destroy his reputation in the volatile economic climate. He would not stand for this and wrote a two and a half thousand word letter of complaint to the Bank of Scotland head office in Edinburgh, beginning calmly, thanking the bank for their professional business conduct, before moving on to why he had decided to change banks, leading to a direct attack on George Morgan himself. The letter was to have a dramatic effect. A few days later, Landale received a letter from David Morgan, George's brother, asking him to dinner. The older Morgan brother was clearly trying to reconcile things and would have been unaware of the letter that Landale had already sent to head office. The invitation was respectfully declined. Meanwhile, head office were wondering what to do with the Morgan situation. They wrote to David Morgan asking for his side of the story, a story which he rejected. George was in Ireland at this point, so David Morgan had time to consider his reply to head office without having his impetuous brother breathing down his neck. The reply was lengthy and attacked David Landale's character, calling him careless and too trusting. He denied any rumours were spread by himself or his brother George. Once George had returned from Ireland and had had time to calm down after reading Landale's charges against him, he wrote his own letter to head office, saying how he heard the rumours from Robert Stocks and not the other way around. After much deliberation, head office admonished the brothers but did not punish them. His job secured, this gave George Morgan the opportunity to pursue Landale as he so pleased. Surprisingly, George Morgan didn't challenge David Landale to a duel. He wrote to Landale and asked for an immediate retraction and apology in writing. This was partly because Morgan, despite being hot-headed, still valued his income over his honour. It was also in part due to Morgan's misunderstanding of the new laws surrounding duels. He thought that issuing a challenge would lead to him being transported or banished, which wasn't the case. And so he wrote his letter in a manner that was meant to tempt Landale into issuing a challenge. 
It didn't work, but Landale didn't apologise either. A back and forth of letters ensued, with Morgan still attempting to get a rise out of Landale. He steadfastly refused to apologise, and still no challenge was forthcoming. Morgan only had one option left. Horsewhip David Landale in the street and announced publicly that he was going to do so. He also purchased two pistols, costing 20 guineas, and asked a blacksmith to make two or three dozen bullets to fit. Landale and his friends were well aware of what Morgan was attempting to do, and they came to the conclusion that Morgan's behaviour to Landale and others was ungentlemanly, and therefore any challenge could be ignored. Landale disagreed. Another friend tried to dissuade Landale by saying dueling was a matter of honour, not business. Again, Landale disagreed. However, he decided that he would only issue a challenge himself if Morgan publicly assaulted him. Meanwhile, George Morgan was practising his pistol skills in his back garden with the bullets made by the local blacksmith. The morning of the 22nd of August, 1826, was a wet one in Kirkcaldy as George Morgan made his way to James Cumming's shop to buy a newspaper. While making some idle chit-chat with Cumming, he noticed David Landale walking by outside. Morgan ran outside and struck David Landale between the shoulders with his umbrella. Take you that, sir, he said. Landale, shocked, immediately went into Cumming's shop and asked if the shopkeeper had witnessed the assault that had just transpired. He had. Morgan followed Landale into the shop, exclaiming, By God, sir, you shall have more of this yet! But Landale escaped him. This made a duel unavoidable. Landale wrote to Morgan, Sir, in consequence of the ungentlemanlike insult you gave me this morning when passing Mr. Cummings' shop, I must request you will meet me tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock precisely at the first crossroad that sets off on the right and going from Torbane to Carden Mill with pistols and give me that satisfaction which, as a gentleman, I am entitled to. His friend, William Milley, delivered the letter as Landale wanted him to be his second. Seconds used to be manservants who would fight each other alongside their masters, but eventually they became less involved in the actual fighting and were more in charge of organising the duel. They would first try to convince the two parties to come to a peaceful solution, but if this didn't happen, the seconds would ultimately umpire the duel. Millie was rightfully reluctant to hold this position because, assuming Landale won, he would be an accessory to an illegal duel and to murder. George Morgan agreed to the challenge and set off to find a second of his own. It was a surprise that he didn't have a second already and finding someone proved more difficult than imagined. Eventually he essentially tricked an acquaintance, Lieutenant William Milne of Burnt Island, through lying by omission. Morgan told Milne that he merely needed a second to bring the matter to a peaceful conclusion neglecting to mention he had struck Landale, meaning a duel was inevitable. Meanwhile, David Landale was in Edinburgh buying pistols of his own. He just so happened to pick up a pair that had been used in a fatal duel in South Queensferry two years previously. These pistols were modern and up-to-date, whereas Morgan's old flintlocks were outdated and slow. Back in Kirkcaldy, Millie and Milne, the two seconds, were in discussions over the format of the duel. It was here that the full story came to light and Milne realised he had been duped by Morgan. The pair were determined to avoid shots being fired. When Milne returned to Morgan, he flew into a rage, essentially telling Morgan he was absolutely in the wrong in this instance. The only way to end the matter amicably was having both parties apologise and shake hands. Morgan for striking Landale and Landale for having written to the Bank of Scotland without copying in the Morgan brothers. George Morgan, surprisingly, agreed to this. Landale's second, William Milley, however, did not agree, as he believed Landale to be the aggrieved party. And so Milne soon realised there was no avoiding this duel. He wrote a memorandum of the discussion between himself and Milley so as to demonstrate he tried his utmost 
to avoid conflict. Both duelists had to choose a doctor to attend the scene in case, well, one or other got shot. The doctors were summoned in the vaguest of terms so as to protect them from the law should the event go to trial. But it was obvious to any doctor why they were being asked to attend a scene in the middle of a field at dawn. Both duelists spent the evening putting their affairs in order. Landale, visited by friends, did not tell him about the impending duel, nor could they tell from his demeanour that events had taken such a turn. When he was visited by Millie, Landale said he was right not to agree to a written apology. Morgan nervously paced the street outside of his house, awaiting Lieutenant Milden's return. Despite his nervousness, Morgan knew that his military background gave him the upper hand, and he even asked a passing friend to dinner the following night. Landale wrote instructions for two outcomes, one of how to deal with his affairs should he be killed, and the other on how he should escape the country should he kill Morgan. In the former he wrote, In the event of my falling, I beg of you to make no foolish lamentation, as I feel confident before God that I am doing my duty as a Christian and as a respectable member of society. The following morning, at around 6am, Landale and Millie crept through the back streets of Krakodi so as not to meet anyone en route to the duel site. They met their doctor and a chase in coal wind. So too, George Morgan and Lieutenant Mill headed for the duel site in a chase. They stopped by their doctor's house to pick him up, but the doctor decided to make his own way. His family, however, had other ideas and hid his boots so he could not leave the house and attend the duel. He did eventually make it to the site, but just in the nick of time. Before either party arrived at the designated site, Morgan and Milne were lost. They had found Torbane Farm, but were unsure where Carden Barnes Farm was. While asking for directions, Landale's chase pulled up. How embarrassing. The convoy proceeded another mile or so up the rutty and umbrageous road to Loch Gilly before turning off up a track to the right, deep into Torban Wood. Some 500 yards in, the track forked and the chaser stopped, and everyone stepped down into the gloom. William Milley bade Lieutenant Milne good morning and told him they would find the first suitable field clear of the wood. David Landale and George Morgan exchanged not a word. Both parties then walked silently up the track together each on a different side of the road. Landale's doctor waited until they were almost out of sight before leaving the chase himself and following far behind. He hid in a wood nearby as the parties jumped a wall into East Park, now known as Sandy Falls. Millie asked Milne if anything had changed overnight. Morgan, seeing the two seconds talking with one another, barked, No apology! The seconds agreed that the duelist should stand 12 paces apart, Milne won a coin toss to measure out the distance and be the one to signal fire. They agreed on the formal, gentlemen, are you ready, fire, as the signal. Neither man should raise his pistol until the word fire had been uttered. The seconds then observed one another, load the pistols. George took off his coat, laid it carefully on the ground and took up position closest to the track, facing east where the dawn was slowly breaking. David walked to the other mark and turned to face his opponent. The two seconds handed their principals the cocked loaded pistols and backed away ten yards to a position of relative safety away from the line of fire. The moment of truth had come. It was at this moment that Morgan's doctor arrived, bursting onto the field in shock at what he saw before him. For God's sake, stop, he cried. What the devil is the meaning of this? It was Landale who replied, saying, Doctor, you have no right to interfere. According to the rules of duelling, Landale was correct that doctors should not get involved. The doctor tried to appeal to the seconds, Millie and Milne, but once again Landale interrupted, Depend on it, Doctor. You are only wasting time. As if to agree, George Morgan repeated himself, No apology. The doctor backed off, and seeing Landale's doctor skulking in the woods, headed over to join him. Gentlemen, are you ready? asked Milne, before being interrupted by Millie. George Morgan had already raised his pistol, literally jumping the gun. 
Oh, very well, retorted Morgan, and lowered his gun once more. An agonising pause. Gentlemen, are you ready? Fire! This time, both men fired. A single report echoed off the trees. Millie distinctly saw both pistols go off, but both pistols went off so instantaneously that he could not distinguish them from one shot. He, naturally, was looking in David Landale's direction, and conceived that Morgan's ball passed close by Landale's back. But as the smoke cleared and he looked at George Morgan, he knew the banker had been less fortunate. Landale's bullet had gone through Morgan's ribcage, through his lungs, possibly his heart, then exited under his left armpit. Millie described Morgan's reaction as a sort of a groan in disbelief and stood there for a moment as if his mind and body could not accept what had happened. The doctors ran onto the scene. Dr Smith, Morgan's doctor, said, I got up to him just as he was falling and observed him struggling for breath and bleeding profusely from the mouth. When he fell, I endeavoured to untie his neckcloth and called for Dr Johnson's assistance. Dr Johnson came over and mere moments later cried, This man is dead! As dead as John Brown, by God! Suddenly, the reality for all men involved sank in. Dueling meant death. High-minded notions of honour no longer mattered. Landale still hadn't moved from his mark and said to Millie, I consider that a just retribution of providence. Then added, we'd best be off. The chase drivers thought Landale looked remarkably calm considering what had just transpired. The two doctors, the other chase driver and Lieutenant Mill were left to deal with George Morgan's body. Milne was understandably upset and repeatedly referred to the memorandum he had written to everyone in the vicinity. Millie and Landale, meanwhile, were attempting to make a getaway. Instead of fleeing to Glasgow via Stirling, as had been the plan, they got the ferry from Burnt Island to Edinburgh hired a coach and arrived in Glasgow that afternoon. That evening, Landale wrote to his agent in Kirkcaldy and revealed his thoughts on what had happened that morning. My dear John, you will long ere have heard of the fatal result of Morgan's insult to me. Providence decreed it. I always felt it would be so, and the consciousness of the rectitude of my conduct, both in the sight of God and man, enabled me to go through it with manly firmness and bear up now against the least compunction for the act, as I feel I have done my duty. Here we see Landale repeating that he thought he was right in his actions, and God deemed it to be so. Upon being told of George Morgan's death, Morgan's brother David simply asked, Was everything fair? The feeling around the town of Kirkcaldy was that George Morgan had it coming, and would not be missed, but that David Landale should have done more to avoid a duel in the first place. Local newspapers picked up the story and merely a week later it uh, it was given prominence in the Times of London. Landale had instructed his agent and Kirkcaldy to make sure his side of the story reached the papers, and once this was achieved he would write to the Lord Advocate to let him know he was ready to face his charge. And it wasn't as if the law wasn't already looking for him. In the hours after the duel, arrest warrants for Landale, Millie and Milne were issued. Fife Sheriff Deputy Andrew Oliphant spent the day gathering 29 witness statements and seemed to be generally favourable to Landale and the Seconds especially, asking if the Seconds would receive bail. Landale's friends were protecting him, as Oliphant wrote, I may state that Landale is a man much respected here, the other by no means so. Ouch. From Glasgow, Landale and Millie escaped further afield to Carlisle in the north of England. On the 2nd of September, Millie and Milne handed themselves over to the authorities, having been indicted. Millie's bail was £100, Milne's a mere £60. On this day, David Landale was formally charged with the murder of George Morgan. He was to stand trial on the 21st of September in Perth, and if he didn't turn up, all of his assets would be seized and sold. He returned to Edinburgh and wrote to his agent once more. He was unafraid of the trial and was certain that the jury would be on his side. When the day came, most prisoners would be led through an underground tunnel to the dock in the courthouse. But since David Landale hadn't actually given himself up, he was able to walk in through the main door, approach the dock, 
surrounded by his friends and his family rather than being shackled to a prison guard. Judge Lord Gillis attended the full court. The clerk read out the charge. Murder is a crime of an heinous nature and severely punishable. Yet true it is, and of verity, that the said David Landale is guilty of the said crime. For David Landale, having conceived malice and ill will against the late George Morgan to fight a duel with him, the following day, at Carden Barnes Farm, Mr Landale did wickedly and maliciously discharge at the said George Morgan a pistol loaded with ball, whereby the said George Morgan was fatally wounded, the ball having entered on the right side, penetrated through the chest, and escaped at the left armpit, of which mortal wound the same George Morgan died almost instantly, and was thus murdered by the said David Landale. The said David Landale, being conscious of his guilt in the premises, did abscond and flee from justice. The clerk laid down the charge sheet. The court held its breath. Lord Gillis looked up at David and asked him if he was guilty of these charges. In what was described as a firm tone, David answered, Not guilty, my lord. Henry Coburn and Francis Jeffrey were Landale's defence counsel, the two men who had cleared James Stewart of murdering Alexander Bozel in another Kirkcaldy duel a mere four years earlier. David Landale had clearly heard of the trial and these two barristers, and while in exile in Glasgow and Carlisle, had written extensively to them, setting out exactly how he wanted his case to be submitted to the court. He had written a polemic against Morgan's conduct as a banker and as a gentleman, and how his own conduct had been respectable and fair. Coburn especially knew how to play this to the jury, especially as the jury was made up of mercantile men like Landale himself. William Milley was the first witness called. He put out his version of events plainly and reiterated how David Landale would have accepted an apology, right up to and including on the morning of the duel itself. He also told of how Morgan had said no apology on multiple occasions. Next up was Lieutenant Milne. He too told of how an amicable solution was sought until the bitter end and of Morgan's intransigence. This suited the defence counsel as Milne did not offer up any excuses for Morgan's behaviour. In fact, he distanced himself from it at all costs. The two doctors were called and reiterated how Landale would have settled for an apology. Witness after witness entered the box and told of Landale's honour and good character. But this was an act of murder. Would it be enough? The prosecutor, advocate deputy Alexander Wood, uncomfortably addressed the jury. I agree that the man standing before us now is indeed of the highest character and respectability. I accept that, whatever the verdict of the jury, the unfortunate gentleman must ever bear the fatal day on which he deprived Mr Morgan of life in painful remembrance. But David Landale had the misfortune to deprive a fellow creature of life and is consequently at our bar to answer a charge for the crime of murder. I admit I have a difficult and unpleasant task in prosecuting Mr Landale, but I have no choice. I cannot disguise from myself, nor from the jury, that the law of the land was at variance with the practice and feelings of society on a subject of this nature. But it is incumbent on me, at the same time, to say that the act of killing in a duel constituted, in the eye of the law, the crime of murder. There is no need to go into the evidence. It was clearly demonstrated, and not attempted to be denied, that Mr Morgan met his death at the hands of the unfortunate gentleman at the bar. Whether the jury might find such alleviating circumstances in the case as might dispose themselves to give a verdict which would avert the necessary consequences inferred by law is for you to judge. He sat down to a silent court. The defence counsel's argument hinged on malice aforethought being necessary for the crime to be murder, and Geoffrey made every effort to hammer home the point that Landale had at all times been eager and hopeful to secure an apology. This demonstrated a lack of malicious intentions. Geoffrey said, It is proper that Mr Landale should answer for his actions. I maintain, however, that my client has not committed a crime, but has rather sustained a grievous misfortune. He was unfortunate in having been injured. 
He was unfortunate in having been the instrument of depriving his neighbour of life, but under the circumstances there is no rule, no practice, no principle upon which they could find guilt in this case when it was proved no malice had existed. Judge Lord Gillis then summed up, echoing the sentiments of the defence counsel. The 15 men of the jury whispered among themselves for a few minutes. One stood and said they would not need to retire as a verdict had been reached. They unanimously found David Landale not guilty. Lord Gillis replied, Gentlemen, this is just such a verdict as I expected from you. He turned to David Landale. Mr. Landale, you must be aware that the only duty I have now to perform is to dismiss you from this bar, with a character unsullied. I assure you I feel the greatest pleasure in performing this duty, and in congratulating you on the result of this day's proceedings. I am confident all who now hear me participate in these sentiments. Cheering broke out throughout the court. David Landale's ordeal was finally over. All in all, the trial took around five hours. The fact is, very few people were ever convicted for participating in duels. Victor Kiernan once said, duelists could kill each other and go scot-free when a poor man could be hanged for stealing a few shillings. This was in part due to middle-class juries not wishing to convict their aristocratic betters. It was also in part because they approved of duelling. It was a private matter between consenting adults and therefore no business of the state. However, had Landale's case happened 20 or 30 years after it did, the outcome may have been very different. The chances of the situation escalating to a duel would have been far less likely, but had it done so, the chances of Landale getting off scot-free would have been equally less likely. There are myriad reasons for the decline in the acceptability of duelling in the UK, far too many to go into here. And what of David Landale after his ordeal? He returned to Kirkcaldy, he returned to chairing meetings of the Chamber of Commerce, his reputation intact. In 1835, he was elected as Provost of Kirkcaldy. He married Mary Russell when he was 42, she was 23, and had 11 children. Sadly, when he was 60, David Landale suffered a massive stroke and was left paralysed down one side. He was unable to attend business matters and his company declined. He died at home on the 4th of October 1861, his company having gone insolvent. There was a happier outcome, however. George Morgan didn't have a wife or children, but his brother David did. David's son Alexander courted and fell in love with one Ellen Landale, one of David Landale's seven daughters. They were married in 1851 and had nine children, the youngest of which they called George. Three other sons, David, Alexander and Robert Morgan, went into business with David Landale's youngest son, Alexander Landale, and set up a company of brokers called Landale and Morgan in Calcutta, India, a company that existed up until the 1950s. It just goes to show that even the worst of bad blood can be reconciled. Thank you very much for watching this video. It was very interesting to do. It took ages to write and if you liked it, I would very much appreciate if you showed me some love by liking, subscribing, leaving a comment, all that good stuff. I've actually got merchandise and I've got a Patreon and all that kind of stuff if you like what I do. I don't like shilling very much, but if you could help me out, that would be very, very good because this, this video took days to research, days to write the script, uh, took a good few hours to record all of this and edit all together. I'd also like to thank James Landale for writing the book Jewel. Um, it was very useful and helpful in getting a lot of the quotes and things for, for this video. I'd also like to thank Kirkcaldy Civic Society for getting me into this topic in the first place as it was a reenactment that, that they did of the actual duel between George Morgan and David Landale that got me into the topic in the first place. And I recorded that and I've, I'll stick that at the end of this video for your viewing pleasure. So 
Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Don't forget, like, share and subscribe, all that good stuff. And I'll see you then. Cheerindrastamaha. Good afternoon, everyone. George Morgan here, banker of this parish. My background is in the army. Although, goodness knows, I was little enough appreciated for what I had done there. But I did play my part in the defeat of Napoleon. When I came back from the army, my brother and I set up our business, a counting house, a bank in Townsend Place. And we were appointed agents of the Bank of Scotland. We have been forced to take action because of the complaint lodged against us by this man, David Landale. Good day, I'm David Landale, linen manufacturer. As we all know, times have been tough. And recently, I've had to ask the bank about bills of exchange. Now, I won't bore you with the financial details, but all the bank really had to do was give me time. They know I'm an honourable man and would pay back eventually. I mean, I'm hardly the only man in Kirkcaldy without a ready supply of cash. The problem seemed to rise with these bills of exchange. Now, bills of exchange, or IOUs, as we sometimes call them, are all very well, but they are not money. A bank can only thrive on money. A bill of exchange, or an IOU, is only as good as the person who writes it. And we have no guarantee whatsoever that the money would be honoured by this man. We had already heard a few stories about him being involved in a few unsatisfactory financial arrangements. I was really at my wit's end with their obduracy. Several times at the start of the year, when the weather was bad, which of course has an effect on the transport of goods, I was struggling. And I had to ask the bank to be flexible with my bills of exchange. I promised them I would pay back eventually, but they were still so awkward about it, especially George Morgan. Yes, I often thought I could make something of David Morgan, George's brother, but George? No, he was all bluster and arrogance. I suppose he got that from the army. In the end, we simply had to say no. He was a totally untrustworthy character. And if all that wasn't bad enough, what made matters worse is when he started to gossip about us in town. Everybody knows that Kirkcaldy is a very small, gossipy place. <laughs> and everybody knows everybody else's business. But everybody also knows that times have been tough since the end of the war, and I have been affected by that the same as everybody else. No, a banker should really keep his mouth shut about his client's financial dealings. But Morgan always was a blabbermouth, and once these rumours start, they are difficult to stop. In any case, it was hardly a secret about Landale's financial problems. We all knew that recently he'd had to lay off a few of his workers. And the poor house, the workhouse, was not far away from Landale and his family. Eventually, things got so difficult for my business that I had to seek redress. The only thing I could do was write to the Bank of Scotland in the strongest of terms and complain. He actually had the audacity to complain about us. The bank sat on the fence. They said they were right to refuse credit, but wrong to break confidence. We were reprimanded for breach of confidence. What a sneak. <laughs> what a blackguard. He deserves to be thoroughly horsewhipped. But I decided that I would put him in a position where he either had to reveal himself for the coward that he was, or else to have a fight with me. And as I had been in the army, I felt that I knew 
a little about how to look after myself. What had he ever done to defeat Bonaparte? And that was the end of it. Or so I thought. Yes. And the rumours persisted, of course. But I expected they would die down in time. So I got on with my business. One day, while I was down the high street, I decided to nip into Cummings Bookstore for a quick browse. While I was there, someone must have seen me and decided to go and tell George Morgan where I was. I finished having a look, didn't see anything I wanted, and left. And who was waiting for me outside? George Morgan, umbrella in hand, without a spot of rain in sight. Apparently, he'd been looking for me for days. In the end, we got so fed up of his lies and complaints that I had to do something about it. One or other of us would have to leave town. So I belted him with my umbrella. <laughs> he could not ignore that. He'd been trying to avoid me for weeks, but he could not avoid that one. I personally would have been quite happy to settle the matter with our fists on the sands. But we agreed to have a duel with pistols at Carden Barnes Farm at dawn one morning. A duel? Pistols? It was usually swords and about women, but guns, firearms. I regretted agreeing to that immediately after. It was still legal, but there had been rumblings in Parliament about outlawing it. And let's be fair, there was a good chance that I could meet my death. Besides, I didn't really want to kill Morgan. I just wanted him out of my hair. But I, I couldn't back down, especially after he challenged me in front of so many people. I would have looked like a coward. I, I did have my misgivings, though. I mean, I didn't even have a pistol. I had to sail across to Edinburgh to get one and learn how to use it quickly. And so... It was to be a duel with pistols. I felt that I had the advantage because I had been in the army and I knew how to use one. I thought about it. I thought I might just go for his arm. I didn't really want to kill the man. A wounding or a disabling would be enough. That would prove my point. But then, no. I thought about it. By his complaint to the Bank of Scotland, he had dishonoured me, my family, and my business. I would indeed go for the kill. And so I won, if you can call it that. Oh, I really wish the whole thing hadn't happened. Both our seconds and some of the crowd tried to intervene, suggest other ways of solving the problem. But no, I really did hate that man. There's no point in denying that. But I hated killing him even more. It was a horrible situation. And of course I was tried for murder and duly acquitted. But that does not change the fact that I killed a man. I talked things over with Reverend Martin, a kind man, and he assured me that I had nothing to reproach myself for. But how can I forget the smell of the gunpowder? The yelp from Morgan who thankfully died instantly. My pursuit like an animal by dogs to Carlisle. The horrors of the trial at Perth. No, oh, that is no way of solving your problems. Things have changed for the town since then, with the arrival of the gridiron or the railway or whatever you want to call it. And there's Nairns Foley, who make that funny stuff that you put on your floor. Times have changed for the country as well. With another war in Crimea, 
trouble in India, famine in Ireland. But things have gotten better between myself and the Morgans. We're on good terms now. And when Alexander Morgan, the nephew of George, asked if he could marry my daughter Ellen, I had no problem with it. And the wedding was a happy occasion. But oh, how I regret the events of the day of that duel.